Good evening and welcome to this webinar. Uh, some of you have met me before. I'm Robin Osborne and I was until the beginning of April um, when I finished my four year term, one of King's uh, research managers and I was responsible for the arts and humanities side. And it's a great pleasure to share with you this evening uh, some of the research uh, which is done by our research fellows. The college has had a research fellowship program uh, for a very long time. Uh, and indeed, I myself was on one occasion long ago, a beneficiary of uh, the college's research fellowship program. Um, but we have from time to time slightly changed the ways in which we recruit um, our research fellows. There was a time uh, when we recruited specifically from the graduate students of the college. Um, uh, having external competitions in particular restricted areas. More recently, we have always had competitions that are open to anyone, but we have largely advertised those in established uh, academic areas, history or classics or modern languages or whatever it might be. Such um, competitions, um, offered a tremendous opportunity for people simply to, as it were, carry on doing what they were doing already. But it didn't offer people much incentive to think differently. It's often a criticism that is made of academic research that it is terribly inward looking. And sometimes that criticism comes in a form of, you know, what's the point of doing research into and then, you know, a favourite target would be medieval history, uh, but classics isn't far behind. The academic world is pretty scornful of such attacks, pointing out that the point of research is actually to make academic advances. It's to be able to see a particular bit of the world differently, whatever sort of bit of the world that is, classical, medieval, you name it. But there is some force to the criticism that academics can get too bound up in their own problems and are not sufficiently bound up uh, in the problems of a wider world. And for the last few years, we have been experimenting with advertising research fellowships, which pick on topical areas. They pick on real world issues uh, that could do with some academic input. We have advertised competitions uh, in inequality, for instance, uh, in prejudice, and so on. And this evening, we're going to hear from three of the research fellows who have been appointed uh, in recent years to these topical uh, research fellowships. And um, I would like to introduce them now. They should all appear on your screen in a moment. While they appear, let me say that uh, none of you as participants appear at all, of course, under the webinar format, um, nor are you allowed to make a noise, but you are encouraged to participate. There is a question and answer button on your screen and you can type in your questions and um, at the end of the three talks uh, we will try to address the issues that you have raised. So let me encourage you to ask your questions um, during those talks as they occur to you uh, so that when the talks are finished uh, we're right ready to go with a question and answer session and that the questions that we ask are the questions you want to hear, not questions that I've been busily inventing uh, in order to ensure that we have some sort of discussion. So um, our three speakers this evening uh, are named on your screen, so I hardly need uh, to let you know who they are. Uh, first up will be Freddie Fox, uh, who did his undergraduate work in London, but came to Cambridge for a PhD, uh, though he spent some time also in Princeton. Um, Freddie was appointed to a research fellowship looking at race. His own interests are in uh, modern intellectual history, 
And in particular, he wrote his thesis on the history of anthropology and, and its relationship to the British Empire. Uh, and uh, he's been in the process of turning that into a book while also turning his attention um, to issues of race uh, in the 20th century in Britain. The second person to talk will be Tejas Parasha, um, who did his PhD at um, Chicago and uh, who works on the political thought of anti-colonialism and wrote his PhD thesis on self-rule and the state in Indian political thought uh, between 1880 and 1950. He has a recent article on federalism, representation and direct democracy in 1920s India uh, in the journal Modern Intellectual History uh, and it is um, to a research fellowship in representation uh, that we appointed him. Representation seemed to be one of those wonderful topics that is topical both politically, the sorts of things that Ted Jazz works on, but um, was also potentially topical for those who worked uh, in fields of art history or literature, um, etc. Um, but as you'll see, we managed to have this wonderful combination of having Freddie and Ted Jazz in the college at the same time, working almost, as it were, at two ends of uh, the same discussion. Our third um, speaker this evening, uh, Kate Herity, uh, did her doctorate at Leicester um, and is a criminologist. Uh, Kate is particularly interested in going to prison, um, but going to prison um, not just to see, let alone to stay, but to hear. Uh, her thesis was an oral ethnography of a men's prison um, uh, under the wonderful title Rhythms and Routines. Um, she has taught at De Montfort before uh, joining us last October. Uh, Kate is still waiting to discover, of course, what the real Kings is like, uh, since the whole of her time as a research fellow has been more or less locked down. Um, but it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to enable her to showcase her research to the world, even though she hasn't had much chance to showcase it um, within the college yet. Uh, that's uh, enough, I think, from me. Uh, I will disappear from your screens and um, I hand over the baton uh, to Freddie. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to do that awful thing where I share my screen and hopefully it'll just automatically uh, pick up on my, um, on my PowerPoint because that's what I've told it to do. Um, uh, I need to now share a particular portion of this screen. There we go. Um, so Robin, can you give me a shout if, if it's, if it's not showing you the first slide? It's perfect. Oh, good. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to start my timer now because we've been, we've been set to a very strict, um, deadline. So uh, for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be talking about uh, this new project, uh, which I've begun at King's and is a total curveball and swerve away from my PhD research, which was uh, on the history of anthropology. Um, so thanks so much uh, to Robin and to the development office behind the scenes who are doing a lot of the um, technical support for this event. Um, thank you to the Provost and Fellows for supporting this research project and to all of you for listening this evening. Uh, so, what will you know by the end of this talk? Uh, this talk will give you a very short introduction to Britain's 20th century migration history and end with some reflections about how this relates to the Windrush scandal that's been in the news for the past few years and that's been so scandalous and catastrophic for our fellow citizens who've been subject to the Home Office's hostile environment. My talk explains how I think we really need to flip the way we normally think about migration control in Britain's recent history from a sole focus on immigration to an analysis that includes emigration too. Um, so this is my kind of main question and uh, the thing that I hope you're gonna take away after nine minutes or so of this, the rest of this talk. Um, but first I want you to think about what you might already know about um, migration in Britain and in its recent history.
And then uh, I'm going to suggest how thinking about emigration might shift some of your ideas. So when you think about migration in Britain's recent history, what do you think of? I provided a very stylized chart on this uh, on this slide, which has an X axis running from 1945 to 1990, and then a Y axis, which shows on the whole more migration and zero is is net zero. So the same number leaving uh, the UK as arriving in the UK over this um, time period. So I imagine that what you probably think happened is something like this. Lots and lots more people arriving than leaving the UK uh, between 1945 and 1990, and this being a relatively steady kind of upward um, trend. In fact, the trend is much more like this green line uh, with net emigration until the 1980s, and net immigration only taking off in the 1990s. So to give you a sense of this from the official statistics, here is a chart from the Office for National Statistics, and it shows inward migration, as they call it, um, outward migration, and what they call balance, which on the, in the previous slide I explained as net migration, um, which is the difference between the two, the balance between inward and outward. Um, and what you can see is what I've just explained, uh, the mid 1980s, a little bump into net immigration. And then from the mid 1990s, um, really a kind of takeoff of net immigration. So using this chart and some other data that I've gathered, um, I can, can we, we can kind of we've got a guess that about roughly 1.5 million more people left the UK then arrived between 1948 and 1972. So as the talk goes on, I want you to kind of keep that probably very surprising fact in mind. So let's zoom out now from this post-war period and get a better sense of the huge scale of emigration from Britain back into the mid-Victorian period. So I hope that you can see this chart. It's possibly slightly blurred because it's had to be crammed onto one slide. On the left-hand side, you've got 1850. On the right-hand side, you've got 1980. And you've got three lines again, which do inward, outward, and this balance, net migration. So the green line is emigration, the blue line is immigration, and the purple line is net migration. And I want to show, show here the trend line of the purple being underneath that x-axis all the way into the 1980s. And I want to explain as well that underneath that green line are some 24 million um, uh people leaving the british isles over the course of of this history which is in world history pretty much an unprecedented at least in european migration pretty much an unprecedented um historic migration of people um so what this graph is meant to convey is that in terms of net migration emigration has been the central form of migration across britain's whole modern era and then if we start thinking beyond that, okay, well, where are these people going? Um, we might need to start thinking about how British history relates to the histories of North America, to Australasia, to Southern Africa, and how those places and the migration policies that grew up on the frontiers of those settler states um, have laid the foundation for lots of later ideas and policies around British citizenship after the Second World War. So why did all those people leave and what effect did emigration have? The last slide showed a chart that suggested that the UK's migration history is entangled with these millions of people going abroad to these uh, settler colonies that then became the kind of what was known at least in the 1940s and 50s as the white commonwealth. And this slide shows, a, shows an advert for Barnardo's Children Home, um, which is on the left hand side. Barnardo's, as well with the Salvation Army and many other well known charities, sent thousands of children out to the empire unaccompanied to go and live often um, in fa collective farms, big farms, not collective farms, big farms, and, um, and uh, orphanages abroad, uh, principally to Canada, but also to Australia. And the right hand side also gives you a little sense if you want to read that of, of kind of what was going on and how how important this kind of idea of empire was and how important as well um, the idea of, of a kind of British race, a kind of Anglo-Saxon identity was across this um, across this emigration. So by the end of the 1800s, there were dozens of these institutions sending out tens of thousands of children. But 
those children were only one part of hundreds of thousands of people leaving annually by the 1890s um, to the settler colonies. So um, what effect did this have? Well, at least to members of the British elite, um, the emigration of at least these children who often tended to be orphans or poor um, and other urban dwellers served two goals. Uh, firstly, it got rid, frankly, of a large body of dependents who were um, uh, on the rates of local ratepayers. So taxpayers uh, managed to um, uh, save by sending these people abroad. Uh, from an imperial point of view, it had the effect that these people would go on to be settlers and populate uh, the British Empire. Uh, they'd ensure its continuing prosperity and importantly uh, its defence as well and that would have a huge boon for Britain in the first and second world war where uh, the kind of patriotism of the settler colonies which was often in question in peacetime really came to the fore in the first and second world war. So this history isn't only a history of the 1890s it's also a history of the 1940s, 50s, 60s and 70s. In 1922, the British government began directly to subsidise emigrants with the Empire Settlement Act. Um, and that act was rolled over every five years until 1972. After the Second World War, this Whitehall funding was supplemented by funding from Commonwealth countries. Uh, Australia in particular sponsored migrants to travel uh, from Britain to Australia. These were known as the famous 10 pound poms. Um, and on the right hand side of the slide, you can see uh, a very staged looking photograph of a family uh, looking at a advert. And uh, in the bottom right, you can probably see that they're pointing at the fact that it only cost 10 pounds to go. On the left hand side, you can see some of the other places that immigrants were, were traveling to, including uh, Eastern, Central and Southern Africa. And this, this flow of people uh, and, and their money and capital and identities strengthened the political, economic and military connections between Britain and its colonies of settlement. And what I've called in the title of my talk, uh, Britain's emigration state, uh, I'm using to describe this transnational community of British citizens that look to Britain for their identity, also for their citizenship. Um, now, what does this have to do with the Windrush scandal and with immigration? It was into this context uh, of subsidised emigration from the 1940s to the 1970s that ships like the Empire Windrush arrived. Uh, the ship's arrival also coincided with a key piece of legislation that was passed in 1948, the British Nationality Act, which ensured that emigrants from Britain, from the UK to places like Canada, had the right to reside anywhere in the Commonwealth. This had the unintended effect of also giving people in Jamaica and South Asia and East Africa also the right to live in the UK. Um, this was an unintended consequence, uh, as shown by lots of recent histories and shown if you look through the House of Commons debate that almost no legislators had any idea that this was going to happen. And actually the Labour cabinet, when the Windrush docked in the UK, sent a civil servant to Jamaica to try and stop any future boats from arriving. So further, further legislation uh, happened in 1962, 68 and 71 that I've marked on this chart. I don't have time to go into the details. I realise that my time's running out. Um, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, the narrowing that happened around citizenship uh, over this time uh, did two things. Firstly, it created a more national citizenship related to the territory of the UK, but it also related citizenship crucially to ancestry. In this way, emigrants from the UK were given a shortcut back to British citizenship. So especially in 1971 and 1973, um, UK immigration law created this concept of patriality, which meant that people with ancestors, uh, mostly grandparents, born in the UK, got access to citizenship. But recall that the 1948 Act had not done that at all. And so this, from a very, very broad citizenship, which in included hundreds of millions of people across the British Commonwealth, became a very, very narrow citizenship based on ancestry. And it's that dramatic shift between 1948 and 1971, and then subsequently in 1981, when just being born in the UK did not uh, give you automatic British citizenship, birthright citizenship was thrown out of the window in 1981, that really caught out 
these so-called Windrush migrants and has created the subsequent Windrush scandal. So finally, um, I think that we need to rethink the way that we think about um, migration and race in Britain. I think we need to put emigration alongside immigration. As I've explained, uh, tens of millions left the country. This created a particular association of migration with empire building and with racial supremacy. Immigration began in this moment in the 1940s with a kind of universal Commonwealth wide um, identity and citizenship law, which was then narrowed further and further and further. Now, as we know from a media gentleman's uh, reporting and from the testimony of our fellow citizens who may also be our neighbours, our parents, our grandparents, friends and colleagues, uh, the injustice of, of these sh changes and if you hadn't updated your paperwork meant that you were often labelled a illegal immigrant, uh, whereas you had arrived as a citizen. Um, finally, two books that I would recommend if anyone wants to find out more. Um, and all of this, uh, which I've tried to cram into 10 minutes, is in a much longer uh, article that's now under peer review at a journal. So please get in touch if you want to read a draft. Um, I'd be very happy to answer your questions uh, as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Tejas, uh, who's going to tell us about something completely different, I think. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Freddie. I'm also just going to share my screen. Great. Can everyone see that? Uh, okay. Great. Well, uh, before beginning, I also just quickly want to thank Robin for inviting us to speak at this event, to all of you for attending, and especially to Felicity and Lorraine and everyone else at the Development Office for organizing and coordinating. As Robin mentioned, I'm a political theorist uh, based at King's, and my talk today is drawn from a section of my current book, which is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. And some of the uh, uh, story that I tell today is also discussed in, in the article in Modern Intellectual History, which Robin mentioned earlier. This talk is also kind of personally close to me because it draws on the last archival trip that I was able to make before the pandemic set in. So <laughs> I think, you know, once we get back to normal, I'm still, I'm going to, this is going to be particularly close to my heart. So I'll speak for about the same amount of time and then hand over to Kate as well. Now, if there is one certainty about the 20th century in history and political science, it is that the century was marked by the triumph of political democracy. Alongside two catastrophic world wars and the ideological battles between liberalism, fascism, and communism, democracy gradually became the dominant and arguably the only principle of modern political legitimacy. The idea of popular sovereignty, namely the idea that laws derive their validity from the expressed consent of the people, attained a global reach that was unprecedented in human history a point illustrated in the graph on the left. Thus, the American political scientist Samuel Huntington, writing immediately after the end of the Cold War, argued that the entire history of the 20th century after 1918 could be told as a history of successive waves of democratization of varying degrees of intensity. This globalization of democracy raises a further question, namely, how was democracy perceived as it traveled beyond Western Europe, North America, and the uh, settler colonies of the British Empire, which Freddie has just uh, discussed? How was it understood, for instance, in the two world historical movements pictured here, the civil disobedience movement in British India, led by M.K. Gandhi, or Sun Yat-sen's anti-monarchical Republican rebellion in China in the 1910s? What might a global history of 20th century democracy look like, which foregrounds the, these kinds of vernacular perspectives from beyond Europe? It's only very recently that historians and political scientists have begun to turn their attention to these kinds of questions. I want to explore this question a little bit in my talk today uh, by turning to the case of the British Empire in India in the 1920s and ask what it can tell us about writing a global history of 20th century democracy. Specifically, I want to turn to a region called Mysore, located in the southern part of the subcontinent, which you can see shaded in uh, red on the left. Now, Mysore was one of almost 500 princely states which dotted Britain's Indian empire in the early 20th century. 
the princely states were, broadly speaking, monarchical regimes governed by native rulers. They covered about two-fifths of the Indian subcontinent and collect collectively included a population of around 80, 80 million in 1925. The, the map on the right shows the princely uh, states in blue uh, against the British provinces of South Asia in uh, shaded in yellow. Now, after the so, uh, sovereignty, colonial sovereignty in, uh, the, in the subcontinent shifted from the East India Company to the British Crown in 1858, relations between the British Empire and these princely states occurred through a complex legal mechanism called paramountcy. In paramountcy, individual states maintained a certain degree of autonomy over their internal affairs, subject to supervision by British officers, known as either residents or agents. And this was a form of indirect rule that was replicated in numerous other parts of the empire. Uh, political communities similar to the princely states also uh, existed in British Malaya and in uh, West Africa, particularly in Northern Nigeria. These states in South Asia varied quite uh, considerably in their size, in their political structures, and even their histories. Some were long-standing entities from the medieval period, which were accommodated by British expansionism. Others emerged during the fragmentation of the Mughal, Maratha, and Sikh empires in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, while others were, in fact, creations of the British Empire. Now, the state of Mysore had a particularly checkered history, even by the standards of imperial history. It was brought under British control by the East India Company in 1799, and the East India Company installed the Wodiyars, which was a family of regional chieftains, politically powerful in the 17th and early 18th centuries, pictured on the right, as the new rulers of Mysore. And the East India Company ruled through this family indirectly. But in 1830, Governor General William Bentinck dismissed the Wodiyar monarchy and brought the entire region of Mysore under direct control of the East India Company, citing misrule by native rulers. After the East India Company was disbanded in 1857-1858, a commitment to return the throne to the Wodiyars was made by the British Crown in 1867 and then actualized in 1881 as a concession to reformist liberal opinion in Britain. By the early 20th century, the region of Mysore was once again governed by the Wodiyar dynasty, aided by an Indian prime minister, though with a British resident always present at courts. And as I said earlier, this was the kind of standard scheme of indirect rule in the princely states. Now, for about four decades, from the 1880s to the 1920s, the Wodeyar dynasty governed Mysore in a fairly absolutist manner. So understandably, popular disc discontent against the monarchy began to brew in the princely state. And by the early 20, 1920s, the state's political establishment was being pushed to experiment with political reforms. In order to avoid an outright popular rebellion in 1922, the state's prime minister promised to introduce a new democratic constitution. And a man named Brajendranath Seal, or BN Seal, was asked to draft a new constitution for the state of Mysore. Seal is a remarkable historical figure, pictured on the left there, looking a bit like a sage. Uh, he was one of the first writers in India to describe himself as a political philosopher. And he was the first one to hold an established chair in philosophy at an Indian university. At the time, he was invited to lead political reforms for the state of Mysore in 1922. He was serving as vice chancellor of the University of Mysore. So he was one of uh, India's most prominent public intellectuals at the time. Um, and for that reason, it's not that surprising that he was selected to lead a committee on constitutional reform. The constitution that Seal ended up drafting for the state of Mysore is a remarkable document. It in fact proved too radical for the monarchy and was never made into law, which is something I'll go into again in a second. But one draft of the constitution has survived in the India office files of the British Library, where I was able to consult it last year. And this is a scan I made of the frontispiece of the document. So essentially, the main argument in this constitutional draft is the following. Seal argued that elected government on the model of the British parliamentary system was insufficiently democratic. Parliamentary republics constrained the active participation of the people as a whole. Only elect, and within parliamentary systems, only elected deputies regularly engaged in government. The mass of the people were pushed 
into extra institutional channels of direct action. So this is him speaking about the, uh, the system of British parliamentarism. I won't read the whole quote out, but what he says is the constituted central legislatures in such governments are filled in great part by representatives who come in by a secondary or a tertiary election and who are thrice removed from the spheres and interests of life they legislate upon. Owing to these inherent disadvantages of representative government by majorities, it happens that direct action uh, uh, by primary interest groups comes into the arena. So said differently, parliamentarism bifurcated the citizenry into two, into a political class that was actively engaging in lawmaking, and then a body of citizens who were engaging in the minimal act of electing their lawmakers. Parliamentary representation thus secured at best a minimal form of popular sovereignty. So Seal's point was that in order to democratize Mysore, one could not simply replicate the kind of parliamentary monarchy that existed in Britain at the time. Rather, as an alternative, he proposed recovering demo democratic forms and practices from Indian history. So in section three of his report, he argued that Southern India in the medieval period was a patchwork of self-ruling territories. Individual villages, towns, and other constituencies governed themselves through local assemblies, what he called primary assemblies. And while primary assemblies were subject to the final dictates of the monarch, in many instances, in daily affairs, they possessed considerable independence of legislation. So Seal wrote, these assemblies, uh, associations and assemblies had an independent origin and sanction. The state, even when it came to incorporate them and grant them charters, did not and could not wholly suppress their quasi-independent character or usurp their jurisdiction or functions. So despite their considerable power, successive monarchs in pre-colonial India allowed individual local jurisdictions to remain self-governing. In their inter -const internal constitution, moreover, primary assemblies were not elected bodies. They were widely participatory with offices rotating amongst different adult inhabitants of a town or village. And most ambitiously in his report, Seal endorsed this medieval system of primary assemblies over the system of British parliamentarism. And his plan had essentially two aspects. First, every individual jurisdiction within the state of Mysore would contain an assembly open to all it, its adult citizens. So this is something like what we now call a citizens assembly. While local assemblies had historically been prominent in the region's politics, Seal argued, by the early 20th century, many had become corrupted and had lost their original functions. And he underlined that these assemblies were to be, be revived and then reconstituted on quote, modern liberal lines with an eye, that is, to removing barriers to participation based on caste, wealth, and gender. As Seal imagined them, primary as assemblies were to be politically egalitarian institutions comprised of any and all citizens from a local constituency. The assemblies would be directly accessible to the citizenry rather than being deliberative fora for members of political parties chosen through election. And then these kinds of primary uh, assemblies were given three main powers. First, they were to be fully sovereign in their respective jurisdictions. They could put laws passed by the monarch of Mysore to a referendum, and they could initiate legislation through submissions to the central government. And on the first point, so each assembly had a right of lawmaking over its area and population. The right was certainly qualified in various ways. So the ruler continued to have veto power and authority to control foreign affairs. But Seal had as his goal, a kind of federalist state with a monarchical central government on one hand, which was coordinating citizens assemblies in each jurisdiction. And then the second and third points of his plan deepened the democratic nature of the kind of federal polity that he was imagining. By giving rights of referendum, and legislative initiation to appropriately reconstructed assemblies, Seal sought to give citizens direct control over laws made by the unelected office of the monarch. So each local assembly could request a referendum amongst its citizens on laws passed by the central government. And additionally, it could approach central government agencies with bills to submit as draft legislation. So again, the exercise of refer referenda was qualified. We are dealing with a monarchical regime here. All assemblies had to work within the existing framework of monarchy, and an individual assembly could not vote to alter the very basic structure of the state. But in spite of these limitations, 
Seal viewed local referenda and legislative initiation as a way to widen popular political participation. And so these three mechanisms of federalist decentralization, referenda, and initiation working together prevented what he called, quote, the genius of the people from being reduced to the mere act of electing lawmakers at periodic intervals. So B.N. Seale's 1923 constitution was actually the first document to propose referenda and direct self-governance through citizens assemblies, certainly in colonial India. And I, I think in uh, also more generally within the British empire outside of Britain, in the sense that this is the first document that uh, proposes referenda for colonial subjects who are not part of what Freddie just described for us, part of the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and it unsurprisingly proved too radical for the Mysore political establishment. In, it angered both those who wanted to maintain absolutist royal power and those reformers who in fact wanted electoral parliamentary government on the British model. So it's not surprising that the constitution has remained a draft and has lain forgotten since the 1920s in the archival collections of the colonial office. As a work of political thought, however, the 1923 Constitution for Mysore is a striking chapter in the history of 20th century democracy. After all, the narrative of democracy's global ascent in the 20th century, which I discussed earlier, assumes an inherent link between political democracy and the principle of political representation. That is, the diffusion of democracy is seen as the diffusion of systems of unaccountable, transparent electoral representation parliamentarism, presidentialism, so on. All of these are political systems wherein public officials are chosen to legislate on behalf of their constituents. And the robustness of a democratic state can be measured according to the efficiency and transparency of its electoral system. So in the graph on the left, for instance, the growth of democracy is charted by measuring the growth of representative institutions and free and fair elections. This kind of electoral representative understanding of democracy cannot do justice to the kind of democratic vision expressed by B. N. Seale in the early 1920s. For Seale, electoral representation was in fact a problem to be overcome rather than a desirable model of popular self-government. So turning to his idiosyncratic statement of popular sovereignty written from a, for a princely regime in the British Empire pushes us to recognize the tensions that have historically existed between popular sovereignty on one hand and the history of representation on the other. And I'll end there. And I will now hand it over to Katie. Hello, thank you. Uh, apologies for the slight delay there in joining you. Um, I am going to go straight into sharing my screen. Uh, and thank you, Tejas and Freddie, for, for sharing your work with us. It's wonderful to hear more about what you're up to. And um, thank you also for um, inviting me to share my work which is now sharing. You would get there in the end. Um, there are, of course, uh, a number of associations between emigration, immigration, and nationhood, and our prisons, which is uh, a subject I hope very much to return to in the future, but it's not what I'm here to speak to you about this evening. So, um, as Robin very kindly introduced, uh, much of my work thus far has focused on uh, prison soundscapes, or sound in prison. Uh, it's meaning for those who live and work in these spaces uh, and also the effects it has on those people subject to these environments. So what do I mean by soundscape? Well, put simply, the oral components of a physical environment or aural components of a physical environment. The British Standards Institute includes um, expectation, experience and emotion in its definitions of what a soundscape and its interpretations consist of, which of course emphasizes the distinction between what is heard and sound as a facet of social experience. And it's this latter point that I am most concerned with here. So if we think of sound as being rich in symbolic meaning, 
um, alarms or bells, their meaning uh, and what the, the social cues they prompt you to consider vary depending on the environment in which they're heard. Um, in prison, banging is a ubiquitous sound. So if, for example, you hear this, as people are being unlocked, it will indicate to you that the regime is running over time. Uh, someone has very urgent business and wishes or needs to get out pronto or is uh, quite distressed and frustrated that they are not being let out and wishes to remind everybody of their presence. So what does a prison sound like? Well, if you ask people who live or work in prison spaces, you will uh, normally get a, a variation on these responses. These are all answers that I've received when I've asked prisoners and staff. A cattle market, bedlam, chaos, a swimming pool, a youth club, madness. Uh, I have a small recording here that I took while I was doing a side project for the prison, just to give you an idea. <laughs> And so we can think of prison as an acoustic community, a community for whom sound is particularly important since the vast majority of the community there uh, spend a significant portion, if not certainly in the time of COVID, all of their time locked behind their door and can therefore hear far further than they see. In my contribution to The Prison Cell, an edited volume by uh, Vicky Knight and Jennifer Turner, I talk about the ways in which considering sound alters the way we understand what it is to live and survive within a cell. Sound can be used as a process or a means of surveying or surveillance, depending on whether you're listening out from above or below and monitoring the activity around the prison. How you do this, of course, depends upon your vantage point or your hearing point. Um, of 711 prison inspection reports uh, published and released between the 90s and 2015, over half refer to sound and noise, and they do that frequently as a means of drawing attention to something that is amiss in the environment, a lack of dignity, a lack of privacy, a volatility in the environment that makes it feel unsafe. In our recently uh, released uh, edited volume, Sensory Penalities, Bethany Schmidt, Jason Moore and I uh, invited our contributors to think about and write about and in doing so demonstrate the importance of the sensory of taking it seriously as a theoretical and analytical tool. Uh, our contributors did that in a variety of settings around the globe uh, and wrote about their experience and sensory experiences conducting research in different uh, penal environments and environments of social control, which was based on my uh, doctoral research partially, uh, as Robin kindly introduced, uh, I spent much time making sense of and attuning to the sound environment in order to understand and reflect and ask what it was I was listening to. Uh, I then used those to inform interview with various members of staff and prisoners, um, although I spoke to most people in the space while I was there, so hundreds of people. Um, the conclusions I came to were markedly different from much of work that has dominated prison studies thus far and certainly comes to prominence in the last 30 years or so, much of which had been heavily influenced by the Strange Ways riots of 1990 and the Wolf Report that was released in 1991, charged with um, recognising and identifying the conditions for this concerted indiscipline uh, and spate of violence, uh, disruption and rioting throughout prisons in England and Wales. Of course, or not of course, but uh, the concomitant effect of that was much of prison studies focus on and has focused on disorder uh, and assumed that order can be understood as some direct opposite state to it. In contrast, I focused on the everyday tune that's normal for here, as one prison officer termed it, uh, the to and fro of everyday life, and I took order as my focus. I also engaged with the prison community as a whole, rather than speaking to staff or prisoners, which is what is normally the approach adopted by prison studies. Um, and I came to markedly different conclusions about the basis for um, people cooperating, which is necessary in order to keep an orderly day going, uh, and going behind their door. 
So that also disrupts and has implications for the way we use ideas from social and political theory. So despite being there during a number of incidents, um, stabbing, uh, violence, incidents at height, cell fires, my focus remained very much on the everyday. So if we accept in prisons, um, or indeed in general, that social life has sensorial aspects, we can see how sound can act in these spaces as a barometer for social emotion. Um, prison, people in prison use emotive terms such as spiky and bubbly to refer to a changeable, volatile social climate. Trouble, it was told to me, has a feel and trained staff recognise it despite the fact that they are not accustomed to articulating it or referring to this as part of their jail craft, but rather speak of it as instinct or gut. Officer Rose told me, I don't know how I can explain that tension or how you can feel that, but you could. Sometimes there is no sound, it's just a nothing, it's just a void, but you sense it, you sense that there's something amiss because it's different, the noise is different. And of course, this also has implications for the way in which we think about sound, about harm and well-being and safety in the prison population. Um, for my master's research, I conducted research in two prison sites, um, one of which was a young offenders institution. Our young offenders institutions commonly house um, young men from 18 to 21. Uh, in this particular prison, there aren't many YROs left, by the way, but in this particular prison, they're a little bit older because many of these young men were serving very long life sentences. And Joe, who was 19, 20, told me that when I asked him about sound, that one day he came in and he found his friend hanging from the bars there. Me and the officer cut him down, but I see him there every day. The alarm reminds me of that. Now, Joe was partially deaf and had just spent some time uh, demonstrating to me how he frequently turned off his hearing aid and couldn't hear the alarm very well. So in that particular instance, sound was being used as a means of explaining and demonstrating a trauma that he re-experienced every day. Uh, but this has implications for staff too. Officer Allen told me she heard the noise all around her, but I couldn't respond to it in the same way. Something was wrong, an out-of-body experience. She then went on extended leave um, to cope with and recover from stress and a partial breakdown. When we think of these sensory experiences, it also prompts us to think about the extended um, experience um, that being in a state of confinement can impose upon people. Uh, as part of the book and to extend conversations begun within it, um, I launched and moderate a blog which is freely accessible to everybody uh, and Gemma recently contributed to this. She wanted to remain anonymous, which I was quite happy to do. Um, she's currently studying for her PhD, but between the ages of 12 and 15, she was repeatedly held in police custody for her own safety. And uh, she wanted to write a piece reflecting on how conducting prisons research had evoked all these sensory memories and experiences for her anew. And she wrote that cheap, sterile cold smell it reminded me so much of being escorted down the corridor often by men twice my size just a body chucked in a cell and kept until another place or person knew what to do with you i suppose that was the message that we don't know what to do with you smell you're an inconvenience to society it doesn't know what to do with you so we'll contain you for a bit in this building disinfecting human traces So all of these prompt us to think much more carefully um, about broader issues relating to safety and well-being, particularly in relation to vulnerable populations, all of whom are overrepresented um, in our prison populations. So people with learning difficulties and disabilities, mental illness, um, PTSD, people with PTSD are overrepresented because of course veterans are overrepresented in our prison population too. Uh, and all of these conditions are associated with particular difficulties uh, and, and sensory sensitivities, particularly in relation to sound, which can trigger. Um, we have an incredibly high staff attrition rate, though it's quite difficult to uh, track down current accurate figures because the, our Ministry of Justice now releases them in aggregate with uh, the rest of the Ministry of Justice rather than uh, Her Majesty's prisons um, probation. Um, but some figures for you to give you some idea of the people that we are speaking of. Um, 
24% of our prison population were taken into care as a child uh, versus 2% of the general population. That's actually a bit of a drop. It varies between a quarter and more of a third. 31% for women and 24% for men. 16% uh, have symptoms indicative of psychosis. 25% for women, 15% for men. Again, we can see that our women's population, while representing 5% of the overall population, are particularly vulnerable. And this is relative to 4% of the general population. 46% of those in our prisons have attempted suicide at some point. 46, oh, sorry. 46% yeah. of women and 21% of men, uh, as opposed to 6% of the general population. So what am I looking at now? Well, I'm here at King's specifically to extend my doctoral research in order to explore the relationship between sound punishment and emotion uh, in diff amongst different prison populations to learn more about survival and the impact of prison spaces and how punishment is experienced by these different groups of people. Uh, I've got a number of writing projects that I'm currently um, engaged in because of course our prisons are locked down in the aftermath of COVID which hit our prison populations particularly hard. Um, so my uh, PhD thesis I'm turning into a book, uh, Rhythms and Routines. Again, I have another book about uh, the stories I was told uh, and I've been invited to engage in a short project with the men of HMP Leicester to explore a book that was written by a former uh, resident of Leicester among the broad arrow men. I think it was written around the 1920s. It's a fascinating look at the prison. Um, and I have to say it hasn't changed a huge amount. Uh, but I do have a broader project and that's to prompt deeper thinking and understanding of what these places do to the hundreds and thousands of people who pass through them every year. There's so much that we don't know yet. And there are many people in our prisons who are in, in danger of neglecting to think about it all. Thank you. So thank you very much to Kate and Freddie and to Jess for that. Um, and we've got about 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, and there've been some questions flowing in while people have been speaking. Um, so let me take those first. Um, Freddie, you were asked um, and you provided a, a sort of detailed written answer, but I think everybody would like to hear the answer to the question because it may well have occurred to others as well as the questioner. You were asked about whether your figures for out migration um, uh, included Irish as well as um, uh, those coming going from England, Scotland, Wales, as it were. Yeah. So the 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 figures are estimates on based on outbound passenger numbers, um, and uh, up until the eighteen seventies, the returns include Irish and British ports. Um, and uh, I, I, put, I put a very long detailed uh, chunk of text in there. Um, but in, in this forthcoming article, I explain uh, the differences, the different patterns of migration um, between Britain and Ireland and between Britain and Ireland and the rest of the world. Because it's certainly the case that after the 1920s, most emigrants, over 70% from Great Britain, go to the uh, settler colonies, to the, to the Commonwealth, um, whereas, I think it's two thirds of Irish migrants go to Britain and the rest of the third go out to the British Empire. Um, and this is especially the case after American immigration laws change in 1924. Can I, can I just follow up on that to ask because you you made this very striking claim that the as well the number going from Britain was was you know higher than the uh, the, the same phenomenon anywhere else in the world, um, would that be true in percentage terms, or are you just thinking about absolute? Now? I mean, I was wondering about Italian immigrants, given the you know particularly at, at, at various points in Italian history, there's been a very very heavy emigration. Yeah, so so the the book by Dudley Baines is the big uh, compar comparative book on this, and Irish emig uh, uh, Italian emigration story really picks up in the late nineteenth century, um, but uh, uh, UK emigration uh, has has a kind of that there's a longer mass emigration from the UK. So uh, in comparative terms, um, Britain is kind of 
right up there um, with with the kind of huge European migrations and uh, I would need to look at the look at the look at the European comparative tables in that very long book. Um, but yeah, I mean they're they're, they're comparable um, for sure. And and when uh, immigration comes to exceed emigration uh, in the nineteen nineties, a large part of that is immigration from Europe, presumably. Let me move on to question ask to Tejas. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the, the question is that the, the system um, uh, proposed for Mysore uh, looks to be a bit similar on the surface to what we find in Switzerland. And is, is there a connection? And I wondered, you know, I'd been wondering myself in terms of that, what sort of historical genealogy can we draw for, for seals? constitutional work yes so see so first of all there are uh, constitutional similarities between the swiss system of swiss cantons particularly with the idea of a low, uh, federal combining federalism and direct democracy uh, there are constitutional similarities between that system and the kind of proposals that we have for mysore so as kind of as observers ourselves as historians we can make that uh, draw out that similarity. Seal himself does not seem to have been aware of the Swiss system. His main uh, point of comparison is the Athenian assembly, actually. And he reads citizens' assemblies uh, in, in the region of southern India as kind of paralleling the almost complete power that the Athenian assembly had uh, in the polis. Um, however, I have actually found a travelogue from the 1940s written by uh, someone who was inspired by Seal who traveled to Switzerland and wrote a, an essay on the system of the cantons um, and said that there are, I can certainly see similarities between what Seal had proposed for Mysore and had never taken off and what we have here. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so even commentators and, and kind of the immediate post-war years were making that comparison. I mean, thinking of it from the Athenian point of view, which of course was what I was doing while you were speaking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, it, it in fact is remarkably different uh, in terms of his approach. And it, I mean, does sortition play any part in Seal's notion of how you might run things? Uh, not a Seal himself, but people who take up his constitution were inspired by him develop this idea much further. So there is an attempt, for instance, to actually read sortition into Indian history to find in, uh, examples of sortition in Indian history and say that this is how assemblies need to be reconstructed. And that's a real point where you can see the Athenian example as something that is almost aspirational. Um, and that's what they want to uh, the kind of um, both find in his Indian history and then recover for the 20th century. Um, I, should say, I should say for those who are not as obsessed with Athenian history as yeah. I am, <laughs> the, the Athenian council which prepared uh, business for the Athenian assembly was chosen by lot um, from all adult males over the age of 30, or at least in principle, that was how, mm -hmm. it, was, how it was chosen. So, so just to, uh, to add to that very quickly, uh, Seal's sentence is that offices should be uh, allocated in an egalitarian fashion, and he doesn't specify exactly what that means. Uh, and so people who take up that uh, idea say that, well, the, the most egalitarian fashion is election by lot sortition. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you very much. And Kate, a question for you, uh, which is about, um, do you want to just claim, as it were, a correlation? You know, prisons are noisy places and they're also terrible places to live. Or how far do you want to suggest a, a causal connection, uh, suggesting that actually if we improve the sound environment, we will improve the well-being of prisoners? It's a tricky one because um... If you contend, as I do, uh, that much of the way we interpret our soundscape is uh, dependent upon the social meanings we attach to the environment we're in, um, the, there is uh, a certain amount of inevitability. Um, even in when you look at prisons, uh, so there's a hell of a lot of work on um, the Sc on Scandinavian exceptionalism, for example, and um, the way in which many of those prisons are in actually quite nice locations. Uh, there's a recognition that being surrounded by uh, 
green is good for the soul, um, as if this is revolutionary. Uh, but people still report um, that pain of confinement, that loss of autonomy, the strain on their relationships with their loved ones, the hiatus to their um, identity and their life narrative. Um, so it's a complicated issue. Certainly it would help, and I think particularly so for people who are incredibly vulnerable. Um, I've spoken, I spoke to one gentleman who was um, on the autistic spectrum and he reported um, experiencing the soundscape as, as a physical weight upon him. And he just, if they could just put me somewhere quiet, and of course he was in the quietest place in the prison, um, but it was nevertheless an incredibly hostile and triggering environment for him. So, um, you know, but it's also possible to manipulate that sound uh, environment on occasion to change the mood. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a complex issue, but I, I would be uh, reluctant to draw causal explanations because I'm, I'm not that kind of social scientist, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Uh, it is time, I think, that we uh, drew this event to a close. Um, but uh, let me say a couple of things before I do that. Uh, one is uh, just to pick up on the Scandinavian exceptionalism uh, that we've also had at King's in, in, in the last couple of years, a uh, group of uh, criminologists as college research associates who are precisely involved in a project uh, in which they are making a um, detailed comparison of experiences in um, Norway, um, Norwegian prisons and, and in prisons in, in this country. Um, so we've got work going on in, 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 in that direction too. Um, uh, the second thing I was going to say was that I didn't say at the beginning um, was that uh, we have managed to attract outside funding for our topical research and uh, Kate is one of two research fellows who are part funded by the, by the Mellon Foundation. And so we're extremely grateful to the Mellon Foundation for making that possible. Um, and of course, we're always looking for uh, external funds that will enable us to uh, make the college uh, research money stretch even further. Finally, let me thank, as our speakers have, uh, the development office who have put this um, together and enabled us to hold this event and enable you to hear us. Uh, a recording of the event will be um, put on the website so if you think there are other people who should have heard it or might be interested in it uh, please direct them uh, to that um, but finally um, I am uh, indebted above all to Freddie Tejas and Kate uh, for their contribution this evening uh, thank you to all of you and good night <laughs>